Hi again then guys and welcome to another installment of Circuit Strategy Guides. Now for those who haven't watched any of these episodes before, I put all of the time codes to the different sections of these videos down in the description. And basically what the purpose of these videos is, is to give you an overview of each major racing circuit, in particular in Gran Turismo Sport. But I will stress that for a lot of these episodes, you can apply it to other games as well. For instance, the last episode was Le Mans, and you can use the principles that I talked about not just in Gran Turismo, but in previous Gran Turismo games, in Forza games, in Project Cars, in a, a wide variety of titles, because even though the track representation changes, the principles don't. How you attack a circuit pretty much stays consistent. Now with this one it's a bit different because not only is it a much smaller circuit than we would typically talk about, of course the Goodwood circuit, but also it's a track which isn't on that many games at all, and this is the first time we've ever had it in Gran Turismo. Now as far as the way this video is structured, and you'll have seen this if you look in the description, first of all I'll tell you some stuff that you need to know about the history of the track, some interesting bits of information that you might not know, then we'll get into a slowed down replay of a full lap driven in the Ferrari P4 on this occasion, to give you an idea of positioning your car, the kind of speeds that you need to be doing through corners, things that I would give you tips about, things that you may need to be cautious of on whichever track we're talking about. Then next we'll talk about the kind of cars which are good to use here, the kind of classes that are conducive to racing, and also the kind of tuning that you can do. Next up is the hazards. Hazards of the track, the kind of drivers that you need to be wary of, and also how you can combat bad drivers on this track in particular. Because of course each circuit has its own hazards when it comes to the type of bad drivers that we will all come across in online lobbies. And then finally, and it doesn't apply quite as much to this track, but finally is endurance racing tips. And of course usually that would be much more applicable to something like the Nürburgring or Le Mans, but this is actually more valid than you might think. And that takes us into the history of the track. Something which might seem boring, but trust me, this is actually a more interesting track than you might think. Now it was founded in 1948, so it's actually younger than the hill climb. The Goodwood Hill Climb that hosts the Festival of Speed predates this track to 1936, which actually really surprised me. I would have assumed that this was an older circuit, but it's not. 1948 is still a very old track though, and of course these days the Goodwood circuit is predominantly known for hosting Goodwood Revival, but way back in the day, even the 50s, 60s, it hosted a lot of different events, including, and this will probably surprise a lot of people, a nine hour endurance race for sports cars in the 50s. And guess what car used to win a lot? A certain Aston Martin DB3S, in different forms, of course through the 50s, but that gives those of you who like doing classic endurance races in online lobbies and recreating old events some pretty good inspiration. You could actually essentially recreate one of those events if you wanted to in the game, because that Aston is in the game now. You could put up against Daytona Cobras and maybe the 250 GTO, have yourself a nice Goodwood Revival <laughs> in effect. Now as far as the less bright side of things, the track most notably, probably at least, claimed the life of Bruce McLaren, who of course founded McLaren in 1970. He didn't found it in 1970, he died here at 1970, and we'll get to the section of the track where he died when we do the full lap breakdown, which is the Levant Strait. He had a, a crash over 100 miles per hour when a section of his car came detached and he lost control. So that was very unfortunate, and pretty much any racetrack, of course, has claimed a certain amount of lives, and I believe he's not the only life to be lost here, he's just a very notable one. Now, as far as the full lap breakdown, which we'll now move into, I chose to use the Ferrari P4 because it's kind of a middle ground. It's fast enough to give you a good idea of the track at high speeds, but it's still a classic, and it's still not as fast as, for instance, a modern open wheel car, or a prototype, or even a number of the Group 3 machines. To give you some idea of how quick it is, it's about four or five seconds quicker than my Group 4 Ferrari, the 458 that I took around here the other day for the review, so it's certainly not slow, but it's still a classic. So it gives you some idea of what you can expect when you drive yourself. Now as far as the breakdown, the first corner that you actually come across is the chicane. That's what it's actually called. Now this is a deceptive corner, but not for the reason that you think. 
The reason why it's deceptive is because people think it's going to be the most challenging corner, but I would actually argue it's the exact opposite. You see that it's a challenging corner immediately, and actually that makes you more prepared for it than any other corner on the track. So I would argue that actually the most challenging corner here is this one, Magwick Corner, because it's actually like two or three small curves all put together into this long sweeping right-hander. And because of the fact that for such a small track, the road undulation actually varies a lot with hilly sections, with a classic car in particular with far less downforce, that can be catastrophic. If you brake too late, you'll go straight off into the grass, if you accelerate over a crest, you'll lose grip. It's a deceptive little track in that way. And the undulation of the road in particular is the thing that you need to watch out for the most. Now, Ford Water is a very easy corner. You can pretty much take this one at full throttle in most race cars, if not all. And even the vast majority of street cars can take it pretty easily. It's just a long curve in right hand. And then that leads into St. Mary's, which is first of all a pretty tight right hand going almost immediately into a curving left. And this corner actually reminds me of one of the curves on Infineon back in the day. After you'd leave the start line, you'd take the first left, then a right, and then there was a very quick left-right on an uphill section where you would go over a crest, relatively near to the start of Infineon Raceway. This is a very similar corner. Now, as far as entering it, you want to break before the right-hander, obviously, but break a little bit earlier than you think you might need to, because the track doesn't give the depth perception in the distance that some tracks do. There aren't very many visual cues, it's just open grass, so you really do need to learn where to break here. Going into St. Mary's on the left side of things, you need to break at roughly the same point where that little lane intersects with the track. You can see it at the right of the track here. Just start breaking around there, and of course you can go a little bit later or earlier, depending on the kind of car that you're using. You could break a little later, for instance, in a Formula car, a little bit earlier in a street car, etc. Now, Levant Corner is also deceptive because this is the one that you need to watch your braking on in particular. Brake at least half a second earlier than you think you need to, because you can very easily run way too wide. And this one is also a compound corner, as I like to call them, because it's a number of corners together into one large sweep and curve. Almost 90 degrees is the first right, but it leads immediately into another, say, 60 or 70 degree curve, and the combination means you can actually treat it almost like one big corner. And if you can get the apex of the corner correct and the angle of the car's trajectory, you can almost make it into one sweeping right hand, cutting across both. And if you get that right, then you can actually make it much quicker than approaching it as two separate right-handers. Now, the Levant Straight, where, as I said, Bruce McLaren died, is pretty easy. Of course, in real life, not so much, because he died there, but in the game, pretty much just keep, keep it straight. You've got a couple of kinks in the road, but just treat it like a straight line, go straight across it, and then you need to be preparing for essentially the last corner, but technically it's not because of where the lap starts, Woodcott. Now, Woodcott is another slightly deceptive one because it's another compound corner. You've got two small right-handers making up a larger overall curve. So break before you enter the first small right hand. Don't cut too much because you'll actually find if you cut across, you'll go way too wide and you'll end up on the sand on the outside of the corner instead, especially through that second little right hand kink. So just keep your speed under control. Don't try and take it too quick because with a very small circuit that's very open and you can see everything, it can be deceptive. You could think it's an easier track than it actually is to take at full speed. So when you go through Woodcart, of course, you need to be preparing for the chicane. The chicane, though, as I said, everyone knows is going to be a challenge, so it doesn't tend to be as challenging as you think. Just slow down nice and early, and actually, don't try to take the corner too quick, because you'll find that a corner that is so tight and technical, a slalom almost, in effect, you will be quicker if you're not trying to be. So allow the car to almost coast into it definitely allow the car to coast through it and then power down out of the corner, just being cautious of how much grass you go onto on the right-hand exit. And then once you've done that, wouldn't you know it, you've done a full lap. 
Now, as far as the next part of the video, that is of course choosing your car and choosing your tuning. Now, the interesting thing about this circuit is it's actually much more simple to categorize the kind of cars and tunes than for instance, the Nürburgring or Le Mans, because with those tracks you need maybe a mix of handling and speed or loads of straight line speed like Le Mans, or of course, special stage route X where it's almost entirely about speed. Whereas here at Goodwood, it's fairly obvious what kind of thing you need. You need tuning and a vehicle that's focused much more on your speed through corners rather than sheer straight line power. This Ferrari, for instance, it's not the most powerful thing around. In its stock form, it's only got around 450 horsepower, but it's very light. And that is the main thing. That's why you'll often see in, for instance, Google images or footage of the Revival that very small cars will do very well on this track. Stuff like your classic Lotus Elans, uh, Cortinas, these very small cars with far less power than like a big Jag or a muscle car will do really well here. This is, if there ever was one, a track which would favour stuff like Lotus. It really is, because the road is very narrow, the corners are deceptively tight compared to how they look, and a small car with less power but a higher average speed will do very, very well here. Now, I haven't actually driven the classic Mini on this track yet, but I should imagine, and I know that some of you guys have probably already done so, and doubtless you'll confirm, that is the exact kind of classic that will do really well on this circuit, because the Mini can get around the Nürburgring far faster than it has any right to. So here, doubtless it will be the same. That's exactly what you need, a small car, very lightweight, that can just go through corners at such a high average speed because you don't have much vehicle to throw around. You don't want some big, heavy, powerful thing where you can't even use half of what it's capable of. So on this track, ironically, some less powerful cars will often win the day, especially when it comes to classics. That's why I would argue something like maybe a Daytona Cobra would be potentially better here than something like a Jag XJ13. Now, I'm not saying it will always win, but that kind of comparison can definitely be made, or like a 250 GTO instead of a Ford Mark IV, that kind of comparison as well. And of course, it depends on the driver. As far as tuning, as I said, it's pretty self-explanatory, just focus on handling. Keep the downforce high, choose the right tires, and focus on your speed and your control through corners more than anything else. Top speed doesn't matter on this track, acceleration of course does, but even then, one of the good things about Goodwood Circuit is that you don't actually slow down that often. You actually keep a relatively high average speed throughout almost all of the track. And the only corner where you really slow down is the chicane, because you have to. Apart from that, most of the corners are taken at pretty high speeds, even in small road cars like a Mini. So as far as the next point, the hazards and bad drivers and how to deal with it. I would say that there are two hazards with the track in particular. One is the grass. As you'll notice looking at the circuit, there is a lot of grass here. And that hazard actually ties directly in to the other hazard that I would say, which is what I mentioned earlier, the undulation of the track. And you could argue there's a third one that ties in, which is how narrow the road is. In a similar way to Monaco, for instance, where it's hard to overtake, but unlike Monaco, you don't have railings to help you. If you go off track on Monaco, well, you kind of can't go off track on Monaco because it's almost like a go-kart circuit. You just bounce off the wall and keep going. Whereas here, if you lose control and go off, you are gone. And it's going to take you a lot of time to get back on track. And you do not want to lose that kind of time. It's the same problem that you'd have on, for instance, the Silverstone Stowe circuit, and especially at somewhere like Ascari. If you go off at Ascari, you're going to be stuck in the grass for a long, a long time before you get back on track because there's so much runoff. And here at Goodwood, there's a huge amount of grass runoff to get stuck in as well, including some sand. So that's the biggest hazard trio, if you will, to put together the narrowness of the track, which doesn't give you much room for error, the amount of runoff that there is to get stuck in, and also more than the other two, the undulation. As I said, going over crests and up and down hilly sections, it's a great way to lose grip. And in a classic, you will feel that real fast because there's no point in putting the brakes on when the car isn't on the road <laughs> because you're in the air, at least your suspension travel is high, you're not getting the grip that you need to. So just break that a little bit earlier. And with this track, of course, any track this applies to, but it's all about preparation. It's about how you enter the corner more than how you go through it. 
allow the car almost in some cases to kind of coast even or pretty close to it. So that's my advice for the hazards. As far as drivers, of course bad drivers tend to act in the same way on most circuits, which is they'll try to use you as the brake, or they'll try to bash you off the track, and of course in a general sense there's nothing anyone can say to completely stop that from happening, but I would actually say that this is a great little track if you combine what I just warned you about in the hazard section with how to deal with those drivers. Because if you're a good driver and you stay under control, you can actually cause bad drivers to, in effect, wipe themselves out. So, for instance, if you notice somebody who's getting on your inside in a corner where they're clearly not fast enough to overtake, and only one thing's going to happen, which is they're going to push you off the track, either deliberately or accidentally, then slow down. Brake. Allow them to overtake. And you'll often find that they will end up going way too fast into the corner and go straight off into the grass. And then you can just retake the lead over them and carry on on your way. And then you've actually ended up with more of a gap over them than if you tried to, you know, head-to-head -head race them lap after lap with the constant worry of them pushing off the track. So often allowing a bad driver to just run away with themselves is a good idea because they'll make a mistake and then you can just get straight past them again. And as far as stuff like people brake checking you, of course, it's always an issue. The best thing I can recommend is brake a little bit earlier so that at least if they do hit you, you've got more runoff to deal with. And also do an evasive maneuver. Swerve the car a little bit and then brake so that they go right on past you, or at least clip you instead of slamming right into the back of you. And again, that applies to any track, but certainly here where you cannot afford to be pushed off, because if you do, you will lose a lot of time. Now, finally, for the endurance tips, it's not my go-to kind of track for endurance, because I'll get bored of a really short lap over like a nine-hour endurance, so much respect to those drivers who did that back in the day. But if you do choose to do an endurance event here, it can certainly be done. Of course, many of the same things apply. Make sure you fuel and get new tires at the right time, but thankfully, this track is actually a little bit more forgiving when it comes to pit stops, because if you miss your stop, it's a very short lap. But again, those hazards are exponentially larger if you're on bad tires, because ending up in the grass is something you really do not want to do when you don't have the tire quality to make up the lap time difference. So make sure you watch the tire condition even more so than the fuel. The fuel doesn't matter too much on this track, because again, it's a very short lap, so even if you overcook it, you're going to get back to the pits pretty quick. However, the tires once they start to degrade, especially over those hilly sections and pretty heavy braking, you're going to notice a difference real fast. And especially with that first corner, the Magic corner that I said about, which is easily, as far as I'm concerned, the most deceptive one, if your tires begin to degrade, your turning circle is going to get wider and wider and wider, and your understeer will become more apparent, and you will end up in the grass. So make sure you choose the right tires, make sure you pit at the right time, and if anything, I would actually recommend pitting a little bit earlier than you might need to, because then you can gain the distance over the other people who will be doing just that, going straight off the track because they tried to push the car for too long. But overall, that's it for my strategy guide on the Goodwood circuit. Of course, if you enjoyed this episode and found it beneficial, I would strongly recommend checking out the previous episodes that we've done, and you can click here on screen to see those as well. But of course, we will revisit with another track in the future, and for those of you who apply some or all of these points, I hope it helps out and enjoy racing at Goodwood circuit. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.